In lesson six, we'll be talking about this subject, appropriating faith. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, tells us exactly how God works miracles. He, and in this particular instance, he's speaking about God himself, that ministereth to you the Spirit. Here he's speaking about the Spirit, who is the miracle worker, and worketh miracles among you. Doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing, or the message of faith? Even as Abraham believed God. Galatians 3, verse 5. Moffat translates this passage, When he supplies you with the Spirit and works miracles among you, is it because you do what the law commands, or because you believe the gospel message? It is as with Abraham, he had faith. In this passage, God tells us that he works miracles upon our bodies in exactly the same way as upon our souls, and that is, by having us hear and believe the gospel message. In fact, God's way of doing everything is by making promises and then by fulfilling them wherever they produce faith. He says it is with us as with Abraham. How was it with Abraham? Note carefully. He simply believed the word of God. He had faith that God would do exactly as he promised. He was fully persuaded by the word of God alone. He held fast the beginning of his confidence when his faith was tested. He was wholly occupied with the word of God in this matter. He refused to cast away his confidence when God, by telling him to offer Isaac, was apparently removing the visible encouragement of his faith. He considered not his own body, or the fact that he was about a hundred years old, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb as any barrier or any reason for doubting that Isaac would be born. Romans chapter 4, verse 19. These things, which according to nature made the birth of Isaac impossible, were not considered by Abraham as the slightest reason for doubting. He knew his age. He recognized the barrenness of Sarah. He weighed the difficulties, but ignoring the impossible, he believed God. Under utterly hopeless circumstances, by looking unto the promise of God, he waxed strong in faith, being fully persuaded or absolutely certain that God would fulfill his promise. Note well, it was by looking unto the promises of God that Abraham waxed strong in faith. Everyone that looketh upon it, that is, God's remedy and God's promise, was likewise the condition God required for the healing of the dying Israelites in Numbers 21, verse 8. When coming to God for healing, be sure that this is your attitude, because there is no healing promised except on this condition. We often base faith on our improvement. We are affected by our symptoms, or by what we see or feel, instead of by the word of God alone. To that extent, ours is not real faith. To be concerned with what we see or feel is to exactly reverse the condition God lays down for us to follow. Everyone that looketh at it shall live simply means that everyone who, like Abraham, so occupies himself with God's promise that he's no longer affected by symptoms shall recover. It means the word of God, not what we see or feel, shall be the basis of our faith. Our looking unto the promise of God is a good reason for looking to God for mercy. There's no time to stop looking until God withdraws his word. Note, it was by continuing to look unto the promise of God that Abraham experienced the miracle. To be occupied with symptoms and be influenced by them, instead of God's word, is to question the veracity of God. Instead of making God a liar, Jonah, from within the fish, gave the name lying vanities to the symptoms and circumstances which seemed to stand in the way of his experiencing God's mercy. Realizing that it was symptoms and not God that was lying to him, he said, They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. God never refuses mercy, but many forsake it by observing their symptoms, which are real, but which are lying vanities, when they say to us that God is not plenteous in mercy to all that call upon him. Abraham's faith was not based on anything he saw, and you must see to it that yours is not. All that Abraham could see was contrary to what he was expecting. After Isaac was born, Abraham had a prop for his faith, 
that through Isaac all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. With his eyes upon Isaac, the channel through which God was to fulfill the rest of his promise, it was easy to believe. So God tested his faith, telling him by offering Isaac to destroy the channel. This did not daunt Abraham. Real faith thrives on a test. Since he still had God's word for it, he was ready to remove every visible encouragement to his expectation and yet continue to be fully persuaded. God had to halt him or he would have offered Isaac. This test was God's way of perfecting his faith, not of destroying it. If after coming to God for healing, he finds you more encouraged by your improvement than by his word, he may find it necessary to test your faith in order to teach you the glorious lesson of believing his word when every sense contradicts him. Faith has to do only with the word of God. In Hebrews 10, verses 35 and 36, God says to all those whose faith is based on his word, Cast not therefore away your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For we are made partakers, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14. Directly contrary to this, after being anointed and prayed for, instead of rejoicing in the promise of God, some say in disappointment, I thought I was going to be healed. They never catch the idea of what faith is. Their idea is to get well first and then to believe that God has heard their prayer. If God's word is the sole reason for their expectation, they will hold fast the beginning of their confidence. It's never proper or reasonable to cast away your confidence as long as you have the word of God as its basis. It is promised that we shall be partakers only on the condition that we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast. During the interim between God's promise and its fulfillment, instead of watching symptoms and casting away his confidence because he had nothing visible to encourage him, Abraham did exactly the reverse. By looking unto the promise of God, he wavered not through unbelief, but waxed strong in faith, giving glory to God. After Jonah, from within the fish, prayed for mercy, he did not cast away his confidence because there was no visible proof that his prayer was heard. He held fast his confidence and added to it in advance the sacrifice of thanksgiving. After marching around the walls of Jericho, Joshua and the children of Israel did not cast away their confidence because the walls of the city were still up. Their faith was based on God's word. I have delivered Jericho into thy hands. If none of these cast away their confidence, why should you? Your state of mind should be the same as Noah's when he was building a ship on dry land and putting pitch into the cracks to keep the water out. In his mind, the fact of a coming flood was fully settled, and the word of God was the sole reason for this state of mind. Your state of mind should be the same as Abraham's. With him, the matter of Isaac being born was fully settled, even though all the symptoms were to the contrary. God's word to you concerning your healing is just as clear and explicit as it was to Abraham. In Mark chapter 11, verse 24, Jesus tells us exactly the conditions he requires for our appropriation of any of the blessings he has promised. He says, What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. That is, ye shall have them after you believe he has heard your prayer. As Jesus said, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, while Lazarus was still dead. We should be able to say, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, while we are still sick. Ye shall have them, is your answer from Jesus, and is also your proof that your prayer has been heard. To faith, the word of God is the voice of God. He has not promised us that our healing shall begin until after we believe that he has heard our prayer. If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. If this is true, then believe your prayer has been heard when you really pray. You must be able to say, we know we have the petition we desire of him, not because we see the answer, but because God is faithful, who also will do it. It is never proper to base faith on our improvement after prayer. 
Some say with great delight, Oh, I am so much better since I was prayed for. Now I know I will get well. This means that in the place of God's promise they have some other reason for expecting to get well. There is no reason for faith as good as the Word of God. Suppose as soon as I pray for a man's healing, he could know he was just 50% improved. This improvement in his condition is not near as good a reason for knowing he will entirely recover as is the promise of God, even though after prayer he should become 50% worse. Suppose you promise your child a certain thing, and the next day you find that she is expecting exactly what you promised, not because you promised it. She has some other reason for expecting it. This would grieve you, for it would prove that she did not trust your word. It honors God to believe Him, even while every sense contradicts Him. He promises to honor those who honor Him. God has promised to respond only to the faith that is produced by and rests in His word or promise. Some expect to believe they have been heard as soon as they feel better. He did not say He sent better feelings to produce faith and then heal them. He sent His Word and healed Him. God Himself sent His Word. We did not worm it out of Him. How absurd, then, to doubt it! Is it not more rational to expect God to keep His promise than to expect Him to break it? Really, nothing can be more ridiculous or absurd than to allow symptoms or feelings to cause us to doubt the fulfillment of God's promises. Suppose your child, after being promised a new dress, should sprain her ankle and cast away her confidence for the dress because the ankle was painful. You say to her, My dear child, I promised to get you the new dress. Can you not believe my word? She answers, But mother, my ankle still hurts. It doesn't feel a bit better. It seems to be getting worse. How absurd is such reasoning! Now if it's absurd to doubt one promise because of pain, then it's equally ridiculous to doubt any promise. Suppose again that after you promise her the new dress, she runs to the mirror to see if she looks any more dressed up, and then says, I cannot see any difference. I do not look a bit better, and then gives up the idea of having a new dress. To learn how to believe that God hears us when we pray is a much greater blessing than is the healing itself. Then the prayer of faith can be repeated ten thousand times for ourselves and for others. In this way, our whole life will be spent in obtaining the fulfillment of divine promises. We have seen how Abraham experienced a miracle, and God says it is with us as with Abraham. In this same way, we can all receive the fulfillment of God's promises. We who also walk in the same steps of that faith of our father Abraham. Romans chapter 4, verse 12. Lesson 7 answers this question, How to Receive Healing from Christ. In the case of the lifting up of the brazen serpent in the wilderness, Numbers 21, verse 8 says, It shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. This was a type of the atonement that Christ adopted and applied to himself. It was a requirement that had to be met if the dying Israelites wanted to be healed. If, as some teach, healing is not provided by Christ's atonement, then why were these dying Israelites required to look at the type of the atonement for bodily healing? And since both forgiveness and healing came to them all by an expectant look at the type of Calvary, why can't we all receive as much from Christ, the antitype? If we cannot, then the type is placed in a higher ground than Christ himself, and the type becomes a false prophecy. But notice that none were to receive healing except on this condition, every one that looketh. Looking means to be occupied in influence with what we are looking at. It is the equivalent of Abraham's refusing to consider his own body and waxing strong in faith by looking unto the promises of God. Being concerned and influenced by our feelings or symptoms is reversing the conditions which God requires. Looking means attention. After God gave the covenant of healing and revealed Himself as our healer by the redemptive name Jehovah Rapha, 
The condition he laid down was that they should hearken diligently and do all. This means attention and heed to his word. Jesus, in Mark chapter 4, verse 24, also taught us that it is by our attention and heed to God's word that we measure to ourselves his blessings. The word of God is the seed. Like all seed, when it is put into good ground, it has the power to do its own work. The attention and heed to the word of God is the way to get it into good ground and to keep it there. Satan cannot hinder the seed from doing its work unless we assist him to get the seed out of the ground. He can only do this by getting you to turn your attention away from the word of God to your symptoms. Jonah called his symptoms lying vanities and said, while still in the great fish, I will look again toward thy holy temple. Then we hear him offering the sacrifice of thanksgiving. This shows what looking means. Looking also means expectation. To look unto God for salvation means to expect salvation from Him. He says to all of us, Look unto me, all ye ends of the earth, and be ye saved. Since God has provided in promised healing, we should dismiss from our minds the slightest thought of failing to be healed. The word looketh is also translated consider. We read that Sarah considered that she could rely upon him who had promised. Instead of considering her age, she received faith by considering the word of God. The word looketh is in the continuous present tense. It's not just a mere glance, but a continuous stare until you are well. It was a steadfast faith that brought the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. The healing process goes on while we are looking to the promise. We are to think faith, speak faith, act faith, and to keep it until the promise is fulfilled. By being occupied with symptoms or feelings, we violate the conditions and thereby turn off the switch to His power. We read in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23 to 27, that Moses endured by seeing Him who is invisible. As far as the optic nerve is concerned, Faith is the evidence of things not seen. But as far as the enlightened eyes of our understanding are concerned, faith is the evidence of things seen. Walking by faith is walking by sight of a better kind. We are to spend our lives looking at the far better things than can be seen with the optic nerve. We see with the eye of faith the glorious things that are invisible to the natural eye. After all, it is the mind and not the optic nerve that sees. You cannot see your money in the bank except with your mind. When you draw a check, it is by faith in what you see, not with your eyes, but with your mind. Faith is the most rational thing in the world because it is based on the greatest of facts and realities. It sees God. It sees Calvary where disease and sin were canceled. It sees the promises of God in His faithfulness, which is more certain than the foundations of a mountain. Faith sees the health and the strength given on the cross as already belonging to us. It receives the words, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses, and acts accordingly. What the eye of faith sees, the hand of faith appropriates, saying, This is mine by virtue of the promise of God. Faith refuses to see anything but God in what He says. It is a great mistake to suppose a thing is not real because it cannot be seen with natural eyes. Suppose you should trust me to blindfold your eyes and to lead you down the street. The pavement under your feet is just as real as though you could see it. Every time you take a step, you are acting a faith, which is the evidence of things not seen by natural eyes. You see only with your mind what I see with my eyes and describe to you. The great spiritual realities and facts which God sees and tells us about are just as real as though we could see them with natural eyes. Because of God, His faithfulness and His promises, faith is the surest ground that it's possible to stand on. To the man who is not enlightened or who does not see the promise of God, it's like stepping out into space. But to those who have faith in God's Word, it's like walking on the foundations of the universe. 
by merely standing on the naked word of God. Millions of sinners have been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Millions have also been taken from this world to heaven. The promise of God has been better to them than a stone ladder reaching from this world to heaven, which could be seen with the natural eye. Jesus tells us that he came that they that see not, that is, with the natural eye, might see with the eyes of faith. After ascending to heaven where he could no longer be seen with the natural eye, he counseled us to anoint our spiritual eyes with eye salve that we might see. By doing this, Peter was made to rejoice more over what he saw with his new sight than he ever had over what he saw with the optic nerve. Walking by this better kind of sight is the happiest life possible on earth because of the superiority of what we are constantly beholding, the best things, the joy-producing realities. Supernatural joy is always the result of using our better pair of eyes. It is important to see that real faith is occupied with God's power and mercy, not with human weakness. God invites us to take hold of His strength. He says, To them that have no might, He increaseth strength. He says also, Let the weak say, I am strong. It is as we obey Him and do this, believing on the authority of His word, that we have His strength, even when we feel weak, that His strength is made perfect in our weakness. We must believe what God says in spite of how we feel. One reason why some fail to receive healing is because they believe what their five senses tell them in place of believing the word of God. We should realize that the five senses belong to the natural man, that they were given to us to be used for the things of this world. But the things of God cannot be discerned, appropriated, or known by the natural senses. No kind of physical sensation such as pain, weakness, or sickness can ever be a good reason for doubting the fulfillment of any divine promise. How foolish it would be for me to doubt the promise of God's second coming because I felt sick or weak or had a pain. And if a pain is not a good reason for doubting one promise, it is not a good reason for doubting any promise. God is just as faithful to one promise as to another. Therefore, it is equally as foolish to doubt God's promise to heal because of pain or any disagreeable feeling as it is to question Christ's second coming because of these things. The ground upon which we claim the forgiveness of sins is the fact that Christ bore them in his own body on the tree, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. And we must believe that we are forgiven before our feelings can be any different. It is in exactly the same way, on the same ground, that we are to appropriate physical healing from the great physician. The healing of both our souls and bodies is based upon the unchangeable truth of Christ's finished work, not on feelings. When God gives you the redemptive name, Jehovah Rapha, thereby saying to you, I am the Lord that healeth thee, he wants you to answer with faith, Yes, Lord, thou art the Lord that healeth me. He wants exactly what he says to be true in your experience. You can make no mistake in saying and steadfastly believing what he says, that he at the present moment is actually healing you and will continue working until you are perfectly whole. Faith is saying and believing what God says and acting accordingly. The blessings we take by a steadfast faith in God's promise will always materialize. When appropriating the healing Christ has provided, we must not be double-minded. James says in chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. We must, as it were, behead ourselves and put on the mind of Christ, which means to see only what he says and to act accordingly. This is implied in our asking in faith. Paul tells us to put off the old man with his deeds. This includes the old man's habit of thinking only according to the evidence of the five senses. Putting on the new man and having the mind of Christ includes our thinking and believing what is written, and saying as he did, it is written. Remember, the new man is not governed by the evidence of the senses. 
The Word of God is very powerful. The Bible tells us that there is no Word of God without power. Psalm 120, verse 7 tells us, He sent His Word and healed them. This is His way of healing both our souls and our bodies. Many have been healed after reading the words in Isaiah 53, verse 5, By whose stripes we are healed. And by then saying, God says I'm healed, and I'm going to believe God and not my feelings. By saying and repeating what He says and acting accordingly, even cancers have disappeared. When we steadfastly believe and act our faith in God's Word, nothing can keep the power in the Word from making all things to become exactly as the Word says. All we have to do is firmly believe what the Word says and resolutely refuse to see, believe, or think of the things that contradict the Word. We're to take sides with God and believe that all we need for spirit, soul, and body is already ours. God said to Abraham, I have made thee the father of a multitude. By taking the new name Abraham, which means the father of a multitude, the patriarch in faith continually repeated God's word after him. I am the father of a multitude. By counting the things that are not as though they were and giving glory to God in advance, exactly what God said became true. As you believe that God has done and given all He says He has done and given, as you constantly obey His word, God makes all the old things leave you and makes all that is of Christ appear in you. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 tells us that God has already given us all the things that pertain to life and godliness. This includes all we need for spirit, soul, and body, for this life and for the life to come. Jesus purchased all this for us, and God tells us He has already given it to us. Isaiah 53, verse 5, and 1 Peter 2, verse 24, tell us that God has healed us. Colossians 1, 13 says, God has delivered us from the power of darkness. In Luke 10, verse 19, Jesus said, Behold, I give you the power over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Romans 6.18 tells us that we are free. When appropriating all this, God warns us in the case of Peter to never look at our circumstances and feelings. The waves were just as high when Peter walked perfectly on the water as when he sank. While he did not look at them, they could not hinder him. But the minute he looked at them, he doubted, and went down. The wind also was just as great when Peter walked perfectly as when he sank. When he did not pay any attention to it, it could not hinder him. God here teaches us that if we are occupied with looking and feeling instead of with Him and His Word, we will lose all He offers us. On the other hand, by steadfastly refusing to see anything but God and what He says, we shall have and keep everything that He says He has given to us. Satan is busy trying to take from us what we take from God, and so God bids us, Hold fast that thou hast. Revelation chapter 3, verse 11. Jesus gave Peter power to walk on the water, but the devil took it away from him by getting him to fix his attention on the wind, representing things we feel, and on the waves, representing things we see. Peter had the power and used it, but lost it by doubting. How many lose the manifestation of healing already in operation, by turning their attention from Christ and the Word of God to their feelings. Before taking the step of faith for healing, get this matter fully settled, that after taking the step, you are going to see nothing but God and what He says. From that moment, doubt should be regarded as out of the question and out of reason, because the evidence upon which you have planted your feet is the Word of God. To watch your feelings or symptoms would be like a farmer digging up his seed to see if it's growing. This would kill the seed at the root. When the true farmer gets his seed into the ground, he says with satisfaction, I'm glad that's settled. He believes that the seed has begun its work before he sees it grow. Why not the same faith in the imperishable seed, the Word of God? Believe that it's already doing its work without waiting to see. In receiving supernatural healing, the first thing to learn is to cease to be anxious about the condition of the body. Because you have committed it to the Lord, and He has taken the responsibility for your healing. You are to be happy and restful in the matter, 
because you know from his word that he takes the responsibility for every case committed to him. When receiving healing by faith, the body and its sensations are lost sight of. Only the Lord and his promises are in view. Before being conscious of any physical change, faith rejoices and says, It is written. Jesus won his great victories by saying, It is written and believing that it was written. Any unfavorable feeling should be regarded as a warning not to consider the body, but to consider all the more the Lord's promise, to be occupied with Him. How much better to be in communion with God and rejoicing in His faithfulness than to be occupied with a sick body? In this way, multitudes have made great spiritual advancement. Others have forfeited sweet communion with God by being occupied with their feelings and symptoms. In Mark 9, verse 24, we read that the father seeking healing for his child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. By asking Christ to help him, he received the needed help, thereby rising to a place of power above the apostles and succeeding where they had failed. In the Greek, the Holy Spirit is called the paraclete, which means helper. Thank God, the Christian can always have his help whenever it is needed. The Holy Spirit is always ready to work in us that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And this, in a special sense, includes faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Since faith is especially pleasing in his sight, he wants to produce it in our hearts by his word and by his spirit. The Holy Spirit is always ready to help every Christian to exercise faith for any blessing God has promised them in His Word. The Bible tells us that Christ is able to save us to the uttermost, and this includes particularly His saving us from our unbelief. This is the sin of which the Holy Spirit came to convict us. Therefore, with a resolute purpose to hearken only to His Word, confess to God your unbelief and count on Him for deliverance from it, the same as from any other sin. His grace is always sufficient to cause faith to triumph for the appropriation of any mercy He has provided. The Holy Spirit is always ready to execute for us the fulfillment of any promise God has given. What is it that makes a man righteous? Over and over again we are told that Abraham was accounted righteous. How? He believed God and acted accordingly. He so believed and acted as to receive from God the fulfillment of His promise. To do this is the sum total of righteousness. Nothing can ever be so important and such a privilege as this, because it is in this way alone that God's glorious program for the individual and for the church can be carried out. In no other way can the will and the work of God be done by anyone. When Christ was asked the question, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? His answer was, This is the work of God, that ye believe. It is only where he finds the exercise of living faith for the fulfillment of his promises that God can work. Since it is by thus believing God that we are accounted righteous, it is unbelief that constitutes us unrighteous. Unbelief is wicked and unrighteous because it hinders and sets aside the divine program which consists of all that God has promised to do in response to faith. No wonder that it was the sin of unbelief of which God sent the Spirit to convict the world. Anything short of our having a living faith for the will and work of God to be done, even though we may call it religion, is something else in the place of His righteousness. Therefore, it is unrighteous. Christ's ability to save us unto the uttermost consists in His ability to save us from our unbelief, which is so deadly to the glorious divine program. The Holy Spirit is given to guide us into all truth so that we might believe it. This is so that the whole program of God may be carried out. How many there are who believe in God, but who do not believe God as Abraham did. A steadfast faith for what God has revealed to be His will for us is our whole duty, and from every standpoint our greatest privilege. How God would sweep the world with His mighty power if all who professed His name were set out to discover all divine truth, to believe it with an appropriating faith and to act accordingly. Faith in God has a much stronger foundation and a much stronger helper 
the Holy Spirit than either doubt or sin or disease has. The Holy Spirit will free your mind of all doubt if you will rely on Him to do it, if you'll keep your attention on the Word of God. The glorious and lasting realities which God has provided for the eye of faith to behold, when really and steadfastly beheld, always become stronger than the cancer or the disease which the optic nerve sees. Doubt, sin, and disease can always be destroyed by the right use of the eyes of our understanding. This is the infallible method for our appropriation of all of God's blessings. All the glorious victories of faith recorded in the eleventh chapter of Hebrews were the result of the proper and persistent use of their better sight. The law of the spirit of life which heals our souls and bodies is much stronger than the law of sin and death. This law, when not hindered by us, will win every time in a million. Every one who sets himself to obtain the benefits of the atonement has an infinitely capable helper whose power, when relied upon, can never fail. As God's grace is stronger than sin, so is Christ's healing virtue much more powerful than the strength of any disease. And the evidence God gives us for faith, His own word, when it occupies the mind, is much stronger than any evidence Satan can give us to make us doubt. What is the exercise of faith? Jesus said to the man with the withered hand, Stretch forth thy hand. Christ first gives faith, then calls for it to be exercised. The man stretched forth his hand in reliance upon divine strength, and it was made whole. As we put forth effort in reliance upon God to do what without Him is impossible, God meets us with divine power. The thing is done independent of nature. Concerning anything that God calls us to do, all things are possible, not to him that feels able in himself, but to him that believes. We see this man's ability not in himself, but in Christ, in whom every part of salvation is contained. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Through our union with Christ, the true vine, the strength is already ours, but must be put to use. It was the effort to put forth his hand which opened the way for the healing touch to be given and the divine life to flow. This act of faith, begun in the natural, became a way of entrance for the supernatural, to meet the man's need. It led at once to an action wholly supernatural, by virtue of the divine power that was imparted to him, to an exercise of the body not possible according to former conditions, an act independent of natural forces and wholly dependent upon God. The act of faith is not only a physical act, it includes the exercise of the heart and mind toward God. The full exercise of faith means that we think faith, speak faith, and act faith. This brings the manifestation of all that faith takes according to the promise of the Word. You may be asking, how can one exercise faith for healing of blindness or of an affliction which does not interfere with the motion of the body? To the blind man, Jesus said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. This act gave the man an opportunity to exercise faith in heart, mind, and body. It was the same with Naaman, with the ten lepers, and with the centurion. In each case they went relying upon the word of Christ and believing the healing was theirs before it was manifested to their sight. Should you deposit a thousand dollars in the bank and come and tell me that you have made me a present of that amount, if I believe you, I would act my faith, draw checks on the bank as I needed the money. I've not seen the money in the bank, but it's just as much mine as though I saw it and had it in my hands. Just so, healing for our souls and bodies is in Christ, whom God has made the treasury of all He is. Sickness from which I have been redeemed does not belong to me, but healing does. Therefore I begin to check on healing. How? By attempting in His name what I cannot do without Him. This is acting faith, checking health and strength from the bank of God. It is counting on something we do not see or feel, but which we know from God's own word is ours, in the same way that the money in the bank is ours, although we do not see or feel it. Someone may say, how can I say that I'm healed when I see disease in the body and I'm conscious of pain? There's an illustration in nature sometimes given which makes the truth clearer. 
One method of killing a tree is to girdle it. When we see a tree girdled, we think of it as a dead tree. Still its foliage is fresh and green for a while, and gives evidence of life. The natural eye sees life. The mind's eye, which has knowledge beyond what nature beholds, sees death. In time the leaves wither and fall, and death, which the mind's eye saw from the first, becomes manifest to the senses. So it is when we take healing for the body. As we claim the word of promise and faith, receiving the finished work, the sword of the Spirit strikes the death blow to disease. For a little time symptoms may remain, but the eye of faith, which beholds the crucified one, sees disease canceled and health given. Calling the things which be not as though they were, the new life is manifested in the body. That which the eye of faith saw from the first as the truth becomes manifest to the senses. Faith sees God in His love and omnipotence, making good the Word. Being governed by natural sight is unscientific because it does not take into account all the facts. It overlooks the greatest and best of facts. Healing by natural means is unscientific because it overlooks important facts the supernatural agency in disease, as well as the privilege of the supernatural in its recovery. We thank God for the thousands who have made great spiritual advancement while receiving healing in this way. The process of faith which brings the healing is a far greater blessing than the healing itself. Many throughout the scriptures became famous for faith as a result of seeking God for what we call temporal blessings. When we have learned the process of faith for receiving healing, we have learned how to receive everything else God promises us in His Word. The church could win millions for the service of God and make them fighters of the good fight of faith by offering to them the healing of Christ purchased for them. May you, by learning to be healed in this way, advance into a life of faith and usefulness in the kingdom of God.